<laughs> so this was originally sent to James, but he mentioned I could send APT directly to you. Thanks. Um, so he says this, Pastor Tim, is habitual tardiness a sin? If so, how should Christians... Now, notice, is habitual tardiness a sin? You want to you notice their questions. Habitual is in there. Is habitual tardiness a sin? That's the question. Is it a sin? And if so, so there's an assumption, like he's already assuming that it is, but if so, how should Christians be living their lives in light of this sin being so overlooked? So there's another assumption on his part that this is very overlooked and tolerated as normal in our society and even in some of our churches. If we can't call it sin, so now he's going to the other assumption, if it's not, if we can't call it sin, then what is it? Does it have another name? And if it's not sin, but just something frowned upon, what is the standard that we're using to say that it isn't good? Isn't it akin to lying? Saying you're going to do something and just not doing it? Also, what's the basis of our motivating punctuality if it doesn't exemplify a righteous Christ-like life? Just to clarify, I'm not talking about being late as a result of something coming up or as a result of sudden tragedy or changes in uncontrollable circumstances. I'm talking about when someone is known by others and even by themselves, either as a person or even a body of believers, that simply is habitually tardy to arrive or begin events, meetings, because it has become acceptable to say it will begin at such a time and doesn't, or we will arrive at such a time and don't. I hope I didn't linger too long. I've thought of this issue a lot and how it even plays out in my own life and how I've even at times placed punctuality a level of importance that could have even been unhealthy and legalistic. And by the way, the Barrientes are on time. And they are early. They are some of the earliest folks at church. I just feel that it isn't something that Christians care about enough and often forget how it can affect other Christians when not held as an important or at least relevant issue in Christ, Roberto, Bobby, Barrientes. So there's the question. And we need to be people of the Word. I mean, we need to be people that are striving to please the Lord. And how do we know what pleases the Lord? Well, we go to God's Word and we, we search what God has to say. And so, what do you think? Habitual tardiness. I mean, is it sin? Is it not sin? Does it depend? If it does depend, what does it depend on? I mean, what does God... We want to think biblically. And so we want to apply God's Word. Is God... You know, there's some things that agitate us, but if we want to be really honest, God doesn't have anything to say about it. Can you think about anything like that? Something that might agitate you and me, but it's hard to find that God thinks anything's wrong with it. Can you think of any example of something like that? I could see how you'd be agitated with that if you lived in a house full of guys. Uh, cleanliness. Cleanliness. That, that might be a good one. Because snoring you can't help. Unless there's something you do that causes the <laughs> snoring. But typically, you can't help it. But cleanliness you can help. And see, sometimes I might have a standard of cleanliness that you don't have. Or you might have one that I don't have. And, and I'm disgusted by your standard or lack of standard 
of cleanliness, and it really bugs me, but God doesn't care that you smell like that, probably. <laughs> that, that cleanliness is next to godliness is not found in Scripture. People seem to love to quote that. But yeah, that would be an example of something where you kind of have these cultural norms. Now let me ask you this. Can something be sin or not sin based on cultural realities? See, and I, w- I would say I believe that that's what the head covering is. I mean, I believe that that is probably a cultural demonstration of femininity, something that, that 2,000 years ago in the, in the Corinthian society was very much recognized as that. And Paul says very specifically in that context, judge for yourselves. I mean, basically he's appealing to their own judgment of the way things are at that time. So I think, I think a cultural norm could be something to take into account. But when it comes to being on time, let's, let's, you know, I, I think that if, if we want to think about this thing, we have to recognize you're not going to find the text that has to do with specifically whether you're tardy or not. But there are other principles in Scripture that we would want to give consideration. Look, I think one of the things that, one of the primary things that we have to ask when we're talking about being late is how does it affect other people? That is key. Because because you know what? If, if, if I say to my wife, we're going to go out to dinner at 7 tomorrow, and we don't go out till 7.30, you know as well as I do. There's no implications there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we determine we were going to go at 7 and go at 7.30. Why? Because the ones affected by it are me and my family, and we're the ones that are late. We don't care. It doesn't affect anybody. Now, the, the thing is, if Daniel's got something to do at 9 o'clock and he's involved in this meal, and I say, Daniel, we're going to be there at 7. I know, I know, I mean, and he's scheduling his schedule around that and we waltz in at 7.30. Now, that's a different case because now we have somebody else involved and there are implications of how my tardiness is affecting him. And if I told him that I was going to be there at 7 and I didn't come at 7, now I've got another issue. What issue? Yeah, yeah, there's an integrity issue. There's an honesty issue. And so there's other principles that we need to think about. What other principles? I mean, maybe honesty, how it affects other people. Leaving a good testimony. testimony. But again, it would be, how am I leaving a good testimony? And we have to remember that this thing is, is this sin or not? Is my being on time or my my not being on time actually something that we can look at and say is wrong. Well, I would say submission to elders and leaders like First Peter five and Hebrews thirteen. I mean, would that would you consider it something? Uh, well, that's an issue. The nature of disobedience. I mean, certainly if you've got certainly if you've got some kind of a situation where you're under authority and the authority that you are under is requiring that you be somewhere at a certain time then yes, you would, you would basically have a disobedience issue. So that would be another thing to think about. Can you think of any others? I mean, one time I didn't know my wife would leave at 6. She strove really hard to have everything ready to leave at 6. 
and I was in there on the computer working. And here all the kids are ready. And so I sinned against her by not living with her in an understanding way. I, you know, she was hurt that I gave my word and yet I didn't stand by it. So it didn't matter to her that I'd be ready to go at six, and that's why she was striving to have everything ready by six. So I look at that as First Peter three. I didn't live in an understanding way. I didn't. There's an in, there's an honesty issue, and a living with his wife in an understanding way. Because because and see here's the thing. This comes back to how it affects other people. There are things we can be late for that affect nobody or who they affect doesn't care. The way it affects them, they don't care. And there are ways that it affects people when it speaks something. And, the, and people do care. And people do take notice. And there is a testimony issue. And so, what is it? What is it that I mean, what are the ways that I might affect somebody else that it would be not a good thing? It's not esteeming others better than myself. See, that's a huge one right there. I, I mean, think about somebody open up their Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. James just went through this portion of Scripture just recently. Somebody read like. Philippians 2, maybe verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Here, I mean, think about this. We are given spiritual gifts to profit the whole church with. You know there are Christians who seriously think about going to church and how they're going to minister to other people. People, if, if you're thinking about others, and you're thinking about others beyond yourselves. I mean, I brought this up many times in my appeal to people to come on time. I prepare sermons. I know what goes into it. I know the prayer that goes into it. I know the searching of the Word that goes into it. I know the study. And I know thinking about the people I'm going to be preaching to. I know what all goes into that. When those brothers that teach and preach Sunday school are up there and they're preaching and teaching and somebody walks in halfway through. Now you think about the implications of that. Because I, I see it and I see exactly what happens. The moment those people walk through that door, people's attention is broken for us. A split second. The flow of thought, what was happening in the preaching, suddenly their attention is diverted. They walk through that door, it's visible, it's in the sight line of people, people see it, they see it out of the corner of their eye, they see the movement, they see the doors open, they see the light come through that back door. What that person is saying is, I really don't care that that guy prepared that sermon I don't care that I just missed half of it. I mean, somebody might care. And like Bobby was saying, unusual circumstances, you know, whatever. Power went out during the middle of the night. There was a thunderstorm. They got up a little bit late. Unusual. You know, flat tire on the way to church. Whatever it might be. You know, if you got kids, all manner of things can happen that you just did not expect. You know, you bad things, ugly things that can ruin your schedule. It's one thing if it's like, oh, it's one thing if it's Bobby Barrientes that walks in because you look at him and you say, whoa, something happened. But when it's the guy who comes in that exact time every single week 
You know what he's communicating? I'm not esteeming others better than myself. I'm not really thinking on my way to church, how am I going to minister to people and what is the most effective way I'm going to... I guarantee that guy is not thinking that. He is not thinking about the most beneficial ways to help and encourage and edify people in the church. He's selfish. She is selfish. She is... And and does Scripture say anything about those who are just selfish and self-motivated? I mean, if Scripture is telling us to esteem others better than ourselves, if it's telling us to take into account the interests of others more than our own, then certainly to not do that is sin. And, you know, for somebody just to be really casual about walking in and doing it every single week, walking in halfway through this guy's Sunday school lesson is to think very little of that brother. And there are implications. And we're talking about coming in late. We want to look at how does it affect other people. And and we should be calculated. We should be thinking about these things. How is my being late going to affect other people? What example is it going to set? What does it say about my love for other people? My esteeming other people? What is it? I mean, does it just say I'm selfish and all I think about is me? Because that's what it speaks a lot of times. It just says, I really don't care about other people. I care about me. And when if I decide I'm going to waltz into church a half hour late, I don't care that that brother spent, you know, stayed up until 3 a.m. digging through God's Word so that there would be something there for me to be fed with. I don't much care for that guy's preaching anyways. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if I come halfway late in that or come halfway late in the 11 o'clock. I don't care. Just as long as it suits me. That's what it speaks and see, in the church, we need to be people that are, the mindset is, how can I serve others? How can I minister to others? What is the best way for me not to be a hindrance to people spiritually, but to be a help to them spiritually? And, and so, certainly, tardiness is a distraction. And in our church, more so than most churches, just simply because our entry points are in the sight lines. I hate that. I really hate that. But it's what we have. It's what God gave to us. And it's what, that we're given the present situation, until perhaps one day we can get an open access point from the rear of the building, um, that's the way it is. And, you know, for all the appeals, you still have a constant flow every single Sunday of people that come in late. And why? It's, it's, because, it's because it is not important enough to somebody to say, I think my coming in late has impact on other people and I want to think about them more than myself. And so I'm going to make whatever sacrifices are necessary to go to bed. You see, everything about getting up at the right time on Sunday has to do when, with when you go to bed on Sunday. You want, to get up at, you want to get up at a time that you can get to church before everything starts? Well, you have, to, you have to back the schedule up. And there are some people that just aren't willing to do it. Why? Because they just don't care that much about other people. That's, and you know what? They can argue till they're blue in the face. But folks, actions speak louder than words. And if, if we love people, it's going to prove itself out by... It, it's just going to prove... I mean, the proof is in the pudding. As my 10th grade math teacher always used to say. And so selfishness. Is it selfish? That's, that's one of the things we have to ask. If Ruby and I decided, you know, if Ruby and I decided to go out at seven, see for me, it's usually not, you know, Ruby's got everything ready to go and I'm up there still on the computer. It's usually, I got everything ready to go and she's the one that doesn't tend to be so timely. And so, you know, there's sometimes I'm just like, 
guys, I, I'm not going to sit down there and wait. When you all are ready, you tell me because I want to redeem the time. And yeah, we said we're going to go at seven, but I know my family and there's two or three in my family that are habitually will be late when not pressed. I press them when it comes to church and certain things that I deem to be very important to be timely with. But there's other things that I don't. I, I in you know, going out to eat or something like that is one of those things. And so it's like James said, that's a matter of understanding because I understand my wife and she's going to be the one that's going to be late. If I have a wife like his, then I want to really make it a point to be on time. Otherwise, I'm going to be sinning against my wife. And you know, my wife got all the kids ready and I'm still in there. You know, I got to take a shower before we're going to go. And here it is, 7.05 and I'm unshowered, undressed and you know, sitting there in my boxers working on the computer. Not that James necessarily sits there in his boxers, but probably putting images in all your minds you don't need. But... I don't do that. I sit just like I am right now. I believe you, James. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but we want to ask, is it selfish? Is it unloving? Is it lazy? I mean, laziness is a big thing. Laziness. How much does how much do the proverbs speak about the slothful man? What's I mean? What does Scripture liken the lazy man to? A door on the hand. What else? Smoke, vinegar, vinegar to your teeth. What's vinegar like on your teeth? smoke in your eyes. It's not a good, I mean, it's not a good picture. But laziness. I mean, somebody look up Proverbs 10.26. Tell me what it says. So is a sluggard to those who sent him. And so, <clears throat> see, that, that's a picture of you've got responsibilities to other people and you can't be depended on to get there on time. And, and you know what? I don't know. I, I mean, maybe, maybe there's a few branches of employment that are possible in this world where they actually allow you to come late, but not most. Most places in this world, you come late more than your allotted share of, of times and you're gone. Employers don't tolerate that. I mean, so there's responsibility issues here. I mean, one of the, one of the texts that sits powerfully with me is Malachi. When God says, offer that to your governor. And you know, <clears throat> when God, I mean, we find it in 1 Corinthians 4, God meticulously is going to examine the motives of your heart and my heart in the day of judgment. Motive is huge with God. God looks at why we do things. Why? Because God wants to see a heart motivated by love, by fear for Him, by reverence, respect. When they come in and they say, ah, we can give them the blind sheep over here, the one with the stunted leg. When you do that kind of thing to God, He takes note. When you honor God, He takes note. I mean, you remember the whole deal with Hannah there? Eli, you remember... <clears throat> not Hannah, but it was the deal with Eli and his sons. And those who honor God, God is going to honor. Those who despise Him are going to be lightly esteemed. Those who don't treat God the right way. And that's what you find in Malachi. You find that with their offerings, with their tithing, just the way they did not regard God as great. And so, what do you think it says to God when you will be diligent to get to work on time, but you won't be diligent to come to church on time, it speaks volumes about your priorities. 
What it says is, I don't want to lose the job because I don't want to lose that money. I want food more than I want to worship God. I want, to, I want food on my table. I want all the things money can bring, so I don't want to lose that job. But I'll, I'll, but I'll come late to church. And God's saying, offer that, to your, offer that to your governor. Offer that to your employer. I mean, it's the kind of thing where well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare offer that to somebody lesser than God. No, but you'll, you'll offer that to God. To me, that's, that's shameful. I mean, I, why? Why? Well, it's, it's all about priorities. It's all about motive. It's all about what drives us. God doesn't care if I go to dinner late Friday night. My anniversary is this week. I'm going to take my wife out this week. If God wills. And you know what? God doesn't care if we go a half hour later than what we originally planned, provided it's with understanding that my wife would not care at all. Nobody's going to be offended. Nobody's going to be hurt. God doesn't care. You see, I want to be thinking about what does God care about? Does, is there anything about my coming late that speaks of irreverence towards Him? That's huge. And you know what? Sunday, the Lord's Day, I, I'm one of the privileged people in this world who gets to go and worship with God's people. And it is, I mean, we live in a culture, we, co- we go to a church where it is expected that we'll be on time. And we know that there's going to be preaching that's going to start at 10. And we know if we walk in late, we're going to distract other people. We know if we walk in late with a bunch of kids, we're going to extra distract people. We know if we walk in late with kids and strollers and walkers and noisemakers, we're all the more going to distract people. And so, does it, does it manifest laziness? Does it manifest irreverence towards God? Does not manifest a lack of love towards other people? Does it manifest just selfishness on my part? We, we mentioned it. Does it manifest dishonesty? You know what? There's, there's sometimes that it's just, you know, if somebody's having a dinner party and it's just like, it's not even socially acceptable to come on time. They just expect you're going to come late. You know, dinner party at 7, and I say, I'm going to be there. I recognize when I say that, I'm not giving my absolute word to be there precisely at 7. But we understand those kind of things. We understand walking into, you know, some kind of casual whatever, and to, walk, to come in a half hour late is... It's acceptable. I mean, it's like Craig's, you know... New Year's Eve thing. You know, what time does it start? Well, it starts at 5. Yeah, Craig, I'll be there. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't mean that if I walk in at 7, they're all going to be just put out and offended. That's, it's not even, it's just a given because we know there are certain things that are like that. And certainly, God isn't disrespected. Certainly, people aren't unloved. It certainly isn't some huge manifestation of selfishness. Nobody cares. It's not sin. It becomes sin in the way that it affects somebody. It becomes sin if it's dishonesty. Because you know what? We know full well there are times when we give people our word that we're going to be somewhere at a certain time and not to come is going to be considered a lack of integrity. It's going to be considered to be dishonesty. What would be an example of that? Hmm? An, interview? an interview. Now think about an interview. Like I have read, I've read different interesting things about interviews. Like, which which missionary was it that went to the mission board to be interviewed, 
and the guy purposely made him sit for two hours I just read that. to test his patience. That was the test. Guy full well knew he was there and he made him wait two hours to see what he was made of. But then I, I read just recently about an interview that was to take place. Both parties were there on time and one waited in one place and one waited in the other place and they didn't know that either one was there. And so, anyway, that's missing the point, I'm sure, but just, just something I recently read about. But I mean, look, that's kind of like the employer situation. You got an interview, you show up late, you're probably not getting the job. I mean, and, and you know what? That, again, your own laziness how does it affect others? Again, that's the question. How does it affect your family if you can't keep a job because you can't get places on time? You can't pay your bills because you can't keep a job because you're always pathetically incapable of getting up when the alarm goes off? That's bad. And so again, it's how does it affect other people? Scripture, scripture speaks about self-control. I mean, self-control is a quality of church leaders. And obviously, it's a, self-control is... I mean, what are we talking about when we're talking about self-control? Well, you, you've, you've got control of yourself. You've got control of your bodily appetites. You've got control. You can go to bed. You got self-control. You can live a disciplined life. You can go to bed at the time that you determine to go to bed. And you can get up at the time you determine to get up. And you can get to places. I mean, self-control is, is you got the ability to control yourself so that things happen when they're supposed to happen. You can actually do the math. And you can live by the schedule. You can, what, what do I mean by do the math? Well, you can figure out, well, if I'm going to be at church and ready to go at 10, I should probably not strive to be there at 10. That's not good. I walk through the door. There's certain things got to be done. Maybe bathroom, if I got a family, if this and that, if I'm going to talk, I don't want to walk in right at 10. So if I'm going to be there at 10 and be ready at 10 to listen to this preacher at 10, I probably want to get there at 9.45 or 9.30. And so, okay, drive time is basically this. If I'm going to get there at 9.45, then I need to leave my house at this time. If I'm going to leave my house at this time, I know I pretty much need to be walking out the door at this time. If I'm going to walk out the door at that time, I really know I need to be done in the bathroom by such and such time. If I'm going to eat, I know that I have to eat by that time. If I'm going to do all this, I'm going to take a shower. I know I need to get up at this time. If I'm going to spend time in the Word that morning, I need to get up at that time. I mean, you're able to actually do the math back all the way up and say, okay, if I'm going to be at church in my place, ready to go at 10, well then you put all the numbers together and you recognize, well, then I need to get up at 645, whatever it is. And to get up at 6.45, if I typically need a good night's sleep of eight hours, back up the clock, yep, then I need to get to bed at that time. And so what happens? Well, if that's a priority in my life, then I'm going to make God my priority and I'm going to respect Him and I'm not going to offer Him anything less than I'm, I would give to my parents or to my employer or to my spouse. I'm going to give Him the best. I'm going to give Him the very best in my life. And so... There's one day out of the week that I set aside to worshiping the Lord with the brethren, not forsaking the assembling together of myself with my brethren. I'm thinking about ministering to them. I'm thinking about the best ways possible. And you know what? If this guy wants to show up at my house 30 minutes before I recognize I need to go to bed, I'm not going to blow off the whole schedule and let him stay there till 4 a.m. and then waltz in 10 minutes before the 11 o'clock service starts. After all the singing's done, and why? Because I'm thinking about others. I'm thinking about the example. I'm thinking about primarily about God. How does it show respect towards Him? And so, 
I think those are the questions that we have to ask. I think any one of us, when we start asking in light of all those things, you recognize, oh yeah, it can be sin. And then I think when we recognize, yeah, but there's times when it doesn't affect anybody else. And, it, and it, there's times when it isn't sin. And so we have to think through all those things. And, and you know, everybody's thinking all the time and everybody's prioritizing all the time. And so we full well know that what people are late for says volumes about what is most important to them in their life. I mean, I remember getting saved at first. It was like, I, I, my desire to be among God's people and to be where the truth was preached, I didn't want to miss a second of it. I'll admit, it's become more mechanical now. I wish I still had every bit of anticipation that I had as a young believer, but I, I mean, I, I wish that God would cause afresh some things to happen in the services that people would really regret it if they missed. I mean, look, you got to ask yourself this. If we made an announcement church-wide, we're going to distribute $1,000 to every single person that's at church at 10 o'clock. Guess what? Some people are going to be there on time that would not normally be on time. Guess what that says about them? You know what it says. You know what it says about what their thoughts are about worshiping God over against what their thoughts are about getting money. You can't serve God and money. And when people will be on time for a job, but not on time when it comes to worshiping God, you have to ask yourself, what really is priority? And God looks. God sees. God knows what we love most. God wants to be respected. You just, you just read the book of Malachi through a couple times. Get a feel for it. And, and you know, one other thought that came to my mind is, does your lateness feed the flesh? I mean, one of the things it says in Romans 13, the last verse, about verse 14, is make no provision for the flesh. And this maybe comes back to the self-control thing. But, you know, if you can't get out of bed on time, that's, that's a big flesh feeder. And I'll tell you this, you feed the flesh at one point, you'll become sloppy at other points. Don't think that, it, don't think that there might not necessarily be a connection between your inability to conquer sexual sin and your inability to get out of bed on time. Why? Because one thing makes provision for the flesh, feeds that animal, and it crops up in a hundred different ways. Be careful. Your, a sloppy life can feed the flesh in ways and have, have implications in your life that you might not think are directly connected, but they very well might be. I don't know, any other thoughts on tardiness? Sure. Um, James 3.16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder and every vile, sorry, every evil thing. Could this apply in the situation where you have somebody who comes late? Um, because their disorder of coming to church, that speaks volumes that not only there's disorder existing in their life, but selfish ambition. Well, there's definitely a selfishness because it's, I'm not really thinking about others. I mean, I would think, like if, if, you know, if for some reason, I, I, I guess, I guess just oftentimes, I, I mean, it puzzles me. Sometimes when people will walk in like to the Sunday school 
five minutes before Sunday school's over. I mean, that's typically like the climactic point in the preaching. The application is being made. I would think, okay, you missed all of this. You obviously are not rushing in because you just want the last five minutes of Brother David's Sunday school. It's just you're not really thinking about other people. Why didn't you sit your family out there in the car for the next five minutes and wait until you saw the kind of movement that told you Sunday school's over? Why? Why? Why are you not thinking about other people? It just puzzles me that some people are so mindless towards the good of others. I mean, spiritual realities are taking place when God's people come together and when the preaching of the Word. I, I, it just it escapes me that some people are just so absolutely selfish and incapable of thinking about the good of others. But that's, that's what's happening. I mean, that's what it's communicating. So yeah, I mean, selfish ambition. It, so, so much of being late is just, you know... I'm good with it. And I don't care how it affects other people. And I'm not really willing to, you know, and eh, I don't I don't like that I come in late and everybody can see me and there's the five elders and they're scowling at me and you know, I don't like that. I don't like that I have the reputation. But see, like so much of that's selfish too. I don't like having the reputation of being the guy that's late all the time. Well, because and what is that? I mean, it just comes down to you know, my, my image. That's not what should be driving us. It's things like the respect of God. It's things like love for others. Really thinking about the good of others. Really wanting to have a disciplined life. And you know, and it does speak volumes. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not necessarily going to be overly inclined as a leader in the church to commit any kind of responsibility to somebody that can't come on time. I'm looking for people who have their act together. That's not an indication of having your act together. It's there's a lot of selfish there's a lot of selfishness. It really communi- I mean it communicates lots about what you're willing to be late for. It communicates a lot about your priorities, what you really treasure most. You might be taking it a little, a little far, but I, I think that it might also display a level of uh, rebellion within that person, being that they don't want to submit themselves to a person who God has set before. You know, let things be done decently and in order. And it makes me think about whenever uh, Saul was told by Samuel not to sacrifice until he came, but he didn't care what time had. Samuel gave him. He cared about himself. You see that rebellion started off in Saul's heart and that's what led him to witchcraft because rebellion is his witchcraft. Well, there's definitely... I mean, there's definitely um, authority issues that are tied with that. And, you know, I, I think that in in numerous ways there is just kind of a ready there's there's a there's a readiness in a lot of people's hearts to reject church authority in uh, in certain cases like this because of course it can always be argued well show me in the bible where it says i have to come to church at 10 yeah but that's see that's not the issue with this the issue is looking at these principles and how you know how they apply anything else would you say that if you're living in that and it's habitual is that can that can somebody be put under discipline because of that because it's habitual like i'm asking a serious question because it's you know it's sin well could they be I mean it'd be interesting to me whether there's cases 
in history where that's happened. I'm su- I'll tell you this. If you go back 200 years and you look at some at what some of the Baptist churches discipline people for, you guys would be really surprised. Numerous things that you would be shocked if our elders brought up a disciplinary situation because of. I mean, basically, the mindset of the mindset of the churches 200 years ago would be. I mean, basically, movie watching and TV watching are akin to the theater back then. You guys would be disciplined for that. Basically, I mean, there there are times in history where any any kind of involvement with sports would be discipline worthy. I mean, I hate to say it, but there are many Baptist churches discipline their members for going to hear Whitfield preach, and uh, I definitely would not condone discipline under those circumstances but would there be examples there very possibly could be in history would we discipline somebody for that no i can just tell you we wouldn't i mean even if you know even if all that i say here is right yes it's it's a chronic manifestation of some of these things or all of these things you know, is it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is it likely going to be the kind of thing that is going to come up in an elders meeting that, you know, they come late all the time? Quite honestly, we'd have to discipline half the church. Now, let me, let me just say this. There is a culture here, and I think it's highly impacted by the proximity to Mexico. Look, there's a reality. Things do not happen in a timely manner in Mexico. And there's an influence there. And I can tell you this, that there is a laxness here that I never saw in Michigan. Never. I mean, the the thought of coming late to a wedding was just unheard of, at least among the broader family, the friends. I mean, that, that was even among all the lost family and friends that I had from my lost days. Going to weddings, you didn't go to weddings late. I actually had bride and grooms not ready for their weddings two hours late down here. There is a lateness in the culture here. And and I think it has to do with the proximity to Mexico because I've, I've not seen it in the north. And when you go to Mexico, things tend to not happen. I mean, there's, there's a cultural reality here. I, I can remember Pat Horner being so upset at one wedding, he was ready to lock all the doors and lock family out who weren't there on time. When, when I first was a pastor, there were some people who were just so regularly late and I, I, it just stirred me up. I got angry. And you know what? I found it was unprofitable. And so eventually... My mindset was, I'm not going to fight it. I'm just going to be happy that they came to church. And if they walk in late, we'll ask them what song they want to sing. And and, and I especially recognize that on Wednesday nights, people are working, people have had class, people are coming home, they're trying to to eat. I, I, I do not make a big deal about things on Wednesdays. I doubt you have ever heard me do that because I recognize people's schedules. And I recognize that though some people might be totally uh, lacking self-control and self-discipline, and that's why they come late on Wednesdays, I also recognize that people are working, people are coming in from, you know, people, people are making every effort a lot of times to get there on time, but because of work and the family and all these things, I recognize I'm just happy we have a fairly full house on Wednesdays, 
But I get to the place, I remember there was a place where I came to that point where I said, concerning people coming late, I'm not, I'm not going to get bent out of shape. I'm just going to be happy they're here even though they came late. And I, otherwise, I'm just going to be agitated all the time and it's not going to be helpful to me. But that was in other days. Now that we're in this building and it's so visible and it's such an interruption, I'm agitated by it again. And, and just because it is a distraction to everybody. And because, and because again, these, these principles, how does it impact others? Because coming late so publicly affects other people, I just wish people would come before 10. If they can't make it, stay outside, sit in your vehicle, don't interrupt anybody, and come in when Sunday school's done. And, then, and if you're going to come at that time, come on time. Don't walk in halfway through the singing and have the light from the door or whatever reflect around and people see things and they're distracted. Don't do that. Why? Because we're singing precious realities about our salvation, about Christ, about the living God. And, you know, look, some, some of you know full well. You know what it is. You know what it is to be, and I recognize we've got distra some distractions we can't help. Look, you can't help some of the things. I, I can't help it if I got five children and three of them are still in diapers and they scream out in the middle of the service and distract people around. I might be able to help how fast I can get them out. But I can help whether or not I walk in halfway through the singing with my whole entourage of family members and, you know, come in and make all sorts of racket and noise and finding seats. And I can help that. I just wish people would be thinking. But I recognize that there are cultural realities. But in the end, what we really have to ask are these questions. Does this manifest a lack of self-control? Does this manifest laziness? Does this manifest selfishness? Does this manifest a lack of love for other people? Is this feeding the flesh? We really have to ask those, those questions. The primary thing I think is how does it affect others? And starting with God, how does it affect God? Does He see that the motive of my heart is setting Him in first place? I'm, I'm going to give the best to Him. He's worthy and I'm going to show it by the way that I live my life, including the time I get places. Especially when I'm going to some place because it involves His Word, His honor, His worship, His Son, His people. <clears throat> so, we got done with one. We'll do the next one next week.